tonight. So as you probably gather, we're talking about all sorts of things um, right now. And focusing to start with on the Giza plateau. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk the last few days, new discoveries, and of course Andy's own discoveries and controversies. And, but you notice every single time there's even a not particularly exciting discovery by perhaps our standards. The world gets in a fever. It's, it's, it's the Giza plateau. It's the, you know, it's the Great Pyramid. It's quite something. I mean, you don't have to be a pyramidian, do you, to feel the magic of Giza. You go into the Great Pyramid and something happens to you. You don't have to know anything about it. You don't even particularly have to be interested in it. But you stand there and your brain kind of skids on it, trying to find some kind of traction, trying to find some kind of context, because you've never been in anything like it before. You don't suddenly you've got these millions of tons of rock pressing down on your head and you're standing there and you're thinking what is this how is this why is this possibly followed rather sharply with who am i you know i mean it's just kind of i, I know who i am by the way it's on here um that's if i get very very confused um but you know it's it's literally awesome the Great Pyramid and Giza, you know, Daddy Pyramid, Mummy Pyramid, and Baby Pyramid. Um, the pyramid somehow manages to turn your psyche inside out. It destabilizes you psychologically, which actually is quite an important thing. Um, you're, you become unsettled. Very, at a very profound level, a kind of magical level, and there's the, a the sort of void opens up in your understanding. And it makes you vulnerable to all sorts of claims, especially if delivered with apparent authority. A sort of contextual void opens up into which can be inserted all manner of allegations and concepts, such as ET visitors, um, all manner of other ideas. And when you're there, anything seems to have equal weight, equal intellectual weight. Now, the point, or one of the major points of this talk, is that the Giza phenomenon, what I've been talking about, its, it's sheer ability to excite and destabilize, hasn't gone unnoticed by those who would manipulate our belief systems and indeed our hopes, as we will see. Many describe the whole Giza experiment as a, as a kind of portal. Sometimes they mean it literally in, to, in their understanding. Certainly the ancient Egyptians meant it literally. It was to take them to another world, to the stars or to, the, to their own afterlife. But it, it's also a sort of portal figuratively. It opens our minds. It takes us to a new place. And the point is, where does it take us to, and who do we choose to be our guides? In our case, what we found when we stepped through the portal, albeit figuratively, was extraordinary, shocking, and actually brought us no end of trouble. And I, <laughs> believe me, I do mean that. But it also certainly opened our eyes. When we finished our second book, The Templar Revelation, um, which, uh, you know, I, I've got it written down here. I mean, I, I know Andy's mentioned it, but I've actually said, which we never pass up an opportunity to mention, was the, uh, oh, what is it? The um, uh, inspiration for the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, I knew it was there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for better or worse. Um, <clears throat> but when we'd finished that, we decided to actually go back in time because in the Temple Revelation, we kind of ended by saying, look to us like Christianity had an awful lot of roots in Egypt. And we thought, well, that's the end of that book. That's a, the, the neat finish. That's the end of that book. But we wanted to look at Egypt in more depth. And we thought we'd go back in time, further back in time, beyond Christianity, and maybe look into the origins of the Hermetic books, which eventually we did, but much more recently, actually, um, in, in Forbidden Universe. Um, but at that time, we thought, right, we'll, we'll look at Egypt. So we did something that turned into the Stargate conspiracy, um, or Starcon, as we call it occasionally, which, as you notice, is subtitled 
revealing the truth behind extraterrestrial contact, military intelligence, and the mysteries of ancient Egypt, which is nearly as long as the book itself, but actually does rather cover it. Um, and as we turned our attention to Egypt back in the 1990s, we couldn't help noticing, we got sidetracked, you know, as I say, we didn't for many years, as it turned out, actually managed to go back and back and back. We got sidetracked by what was going on in 1990s Egypt, basically a huge amount of digging at Giza, um, and what might be called rather blatant, obvious posturing um, on Giza by several agencies and individuals. Uh, in the lead up, especially to the millennium. And this was fascinating. Uh, it, it, it seemed there were all sorts of agendas, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and although much of what we're about to examine happened then, the story does go on. And the lessons that we learned, which we are about to share, uh, are, remain, sadly, all too relevant. And they are as jaw-dropping as ever. There was, as you'll know back then, a huge surge in uh, what might be termed alternative Egyptology, um, almost an Egypt fever around the millennium. Um, we were, in fact, to add to this, but in a very different way. Um, our book, Starcon, uh, did upset a lot of people. We did not set out to do that, believe me. Um, it did upset a lot of people because, basically, it criticized some of the prominent names in the field. Um, basically, what we did was we double and triple checked their research in their books, um, and certain big names, with some surprising results, which we set out in Stargate Conspiracy. Um, and although, as I say, we upset the writers and a lot of their readers, a lot of their fans, um, there are some things which just have to be said. Um, Particularly, one of the things that gripped us, um, really, you know, floored us, really, was what happens when you claim to come up with answers to ancient mysteries upon which you then hang a modern message. Or worse, when you actually manipulate the facts to fit in with what is actually a political agenda. Um, Incidentally, by the way, of course, we got called skeptics, um, among other choice terms, um, but we're not skeptics in the usual sense at all. Um, for example, we acknowledge a genuine unseen world um, does exist. More to the point here, we do fully admit that there are such things as ancient mysteries, um, mysteries about the ancient past, absolutely. But as an aside, Starcon, as it turned out, wasn't the wisest career move. Um, although it was published by one of the biggest international publishers, Little Brown, um, we ended up being blacklisted uh, as a direct result of intervention by some of the big names we had criticised. Um, and if you think that's not very much, let me say that we were blacklisted in 1999, and we still are by many of those big name publishers for one specific reason. Uh, anyway, Starcorn. Um, we were always suspicious of those who claim to have the answers, the whole answers, to the great mysteries of the past, or claim to be in, in touch with great spiritual power, or claim to be the arbiters of the whole truth. And it's very interesting, the psychology involved. Um, once people are excited, and nothing is potentially as exciting, of course, as an alleged contact with the gods, or with alien gods, maybe, um, people will go that extra mile with you into territory they would otherwise never even consider or even shun. Um, once you've convinced them that you know magic, that you have contact with the ancient gods, that you, will, you know when the ancient gods are going to arrive, um, people will stick with you no matter what. I mean, you have created a cult. And I stand here and I know what I'm talking about because I used to be a Mormon missionary. So, I mean, you know, I know about cults. I know how they operate. Um, this is, this whole idea of manipulation of ideas, half facts, beliefs, um, is what we believe some people were and are attempting to do 
only using a belief in contact with ancient, advanced extraterrestrials, the gods of the ancient world, who, according to the belief system, created human civilization, perhaps even created the human race itself, perhaps again through genetic engineering or manipulation, and who've watched over us ever since, and who are coming back to save us from ourselves, essentially. And there are, though, this whole scenario, lessons to be learnt from history. Take, for example, the belief in Atlantis. Now, I'm not talking about a geographical place, the sunken island. You know, a, a belief that it existed is, you know, is straightforward enough. Um, but I am talking about its associations with a lost spiritually advanced race. In, in, in contact with advanced extraterrestrial beings, for example. All that is incredibly potent. It has the potential for being used, whether these things are true or not. Now, one bunch of people who did love Atlantis, um, the Nazis, and you'll see, obviously, Hitler, and this here is Rudolf Hess, his deputy, his very mystically-minded deputy. Um, now, the existence of Atlantis was a central feature of the mystical ideas promoted by the Nazis. And obviously, we are not saying anybody who has spiritual ideas connected with Atlantis is a closet Nazi. That is just ridiculous. We're not saying that. But we're saying that if you have to be very careful about the way potent ideas are manipulated, or at the very beginning, even presented, um, I mean, if you specifically, bearing all that in mind, look at what was used by one particular cult connected with, albeit you might think tangentially, but connected with the Giza, what was going on at Giza. In October 1994, there were the mass suicides, or perhaps murders, uh, of 53 members of the Solar Temple cult. And sadly, that's the fruit of their labors there. Um, they apparently believed that their souls um, would be transported to their true home in Sirius, which is, of course, all sadly par for the course for a modern cult. But there was a twist, and it was a twist that was very contemporary with um, the end of the 1990s. They explicitly linked Rudolf Gantenbrink's discovery of a door to a secret chamber in the Great Pyramid the previous year with their deaths. The discovery of Gantenbrink's door they saw as being figuratively the door, the trigger for them to go off and let their souls fly free. Now, obviously, um, and, and as you probably know, this, the, the whole Gantenbrink thing was brought to the public attention by Robert Boval. Now, obviously, we are not out blaming either Boval or Gantenbrink for what happened to the cult. But it does show how careful we have to be when it comes to speculations about secret chambers and great ancient secrets. When we tip over from fact into belief, when we tip over and we invite people to share their own mystical experiences and conflate everything together. It pays to unravel these often complex connections, as um, Clive will explain. But first, we want to know why, actually, did the Solar Temple have a thing about, about Sirius? The unraveling, as I say, it's all very complicated. The unraveling begins. This is Alice Bailey, as a lot of you might know. She's really the creator, the inspirer of the New Age. Um, she was a channeler um, who, whose great contact with the other world was someone called a, a spirit called the Tibetan, a master. Um, many of her teachings, however, um, were appallingly racist and anti-Semitic even by the standards of her day. Um, uh, perhaps her, the worst example is what she blithely presented to her followers, uh, obviously, which came via um, her spirit guide, the Tibetan, 
Um, she talked about the, um, the Americans bombing of, uh, uh, atomic bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And she said that in fact, it was all part of, essentially all part of life's rich pattern. Um, it was, um, it was the process of healing the yellow root race whose time was over out of this world to make way for others. Um, so that's all right then. Um, she also taught, interestingly, that Freemasonry was the terrestrial version of an initiatory school that exists on Sirius, uh, presumably meaning one of the planets in the system, and that Freemasonry was founded by beings from Sirius. Now, significantly, her husband, Foster Bailey, was, guess what, a prominent Freemason. Um, and he introduced her ideas, including ideas about Sirius, into the Brotherhood. Um, now, by the way, when Clive died talking about Freemasonry, we're not saying it's a good or a bad thing, we're just saying this is what happened. So it was obviously Alice Bailey's husband was a Freemason and he introduced ideas, her ideas, into Freemasonry. Fact. And then there's this guy, Schwala de Lubitsch, the godfather of the alternative Egypt genre. All the major writers on the subject, Graham Hancock, Robert Beval, Robert Temple, cite Schwala de Lubitsch, his work on ancient Egypt with respect and admiration. And John Anthony West's seminal book, uh, Serpent in the Sky, 1979, was actually written specifically to bring Schwaller's ideas about ancient Egypt to a popular audience. And it was West's desire, actually, to prove Schwaller's, Schwaller right, essentially, that led him to get Robert Schock involved in, you know, that whole business of studying the water erosion on the Sphinx. Um, and it was that research that, more than anything, triggered the explosion of interest in ancient Egypt when it did, in, in the lead up to the millennium. Um, this seemingly provided evidence that the Sphinx is much older than conventional history admits, thereby, in Westview, proving Schwaller right. Although it did actually prove him just as wrong, since Schwaller and West thought that the erosion was from a single gigantic flood, not centuries um, of drip, drip, drip rainfall erosion. Um, and Schock's evidence was also tweaked by Graham Hancock to support the 10,500 BC idea, and ditto with Boval and Orion, it, which all sort of works, but what doesn't fit in with all this insistence is that it fits the stars in 10,500 BC. And if you want to know all the details of all of that, it's obviously in the book. But about Schwaller de Lubitsch, what none of these writers say is that his politics were so far to the right that they crossed the border into fascism. He was racist, virulently anti-Semitic, and also believed that women were intellectually inferior to men. All of that you might think, well, you know, it was in the old days, that's what people thought. No, even by the standards of the day. Um, and it appears that his work on ancient Egypt and the priesthood um, was actually heavily influenced by his political ideas and racial ideas, actually. For example, Schwaller de declared that there were no blacks ever in power in ancient Egypt. Um, and also, he, he changed the famous French rallying cry of liberty, equality, fraternity. He said, no, 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 let's change that. Let's have liberty, hierarchy, and fraternity. In other words, rule by an elite not in itself very shock horror, perhaps. And it must be said in all fairness that one shouldn't judge people by who they happen to inspire. That would be ridiculous. But if people buy into ideas because they share a mindset, that is very telling. And Schwaller's views gelled so readily with those of the Nazis that they, I mean, particularly Rudolf Hess, who we were looking at, um, uh, Hitler's deputy, um, that, I mean, basically, they took um, one of his uh, designs, then used it for uh, one of their uniforms, um, um, and they, they particularly admired him. They talked about him a lot. 
But the thing that is even more damning, if it can be more damning than being a proto-Nazi, um, was that Schwala de Lubitsch was, was actually a synarchist. Um, and synarchists are the most successful, perhaps, certainly the most sinister and dangerous secret society that Europe has ever seen. Um, and as demonstrated by his rallying cry, which included the word hierarchy, it's about rule by an elite from behind the scenes. All white, all men, all men like him, of course, and all in our book. Um, our point is that is not that those authors in 1990s who expressed such admiration for him were similarly sinister. I mean, again, that's ridiculous. But you know, perhaps they could have told us the whole story about him, so we could make up our own minds about whether to find him admirable or not. Um, the main agenda behind many of the prominent writings around the millennium um, was actually to prove Edgar Cayce right. Um, now, please don't run away. I am not going to say that Edgar Cayce was a Nazi. He wasn't. He was a lovely bloke. Um, he, um, as we know, he was a very talented healer um, and psychic. Um, when he actually established his reputation as a healer, um, he attracted the interest of American politicians um, and military chiefs. Um, and he was a personal friend of the then US uh, head of the Secret Service. And he was also called on for advice by President, President Woodrow Wilson. Um, no one knows why, which is a bit sad, intriguing. Um, it could be for personal healing reasons. Um, or there's a rumor that um, Wilson wanted him to help with the setting up of the League of Nations, which would have been brilliant. Um, Edgar Cayce is now, of course, uh, most famous for his psychic readings about the ancient past and the history of the human race, uh, most famously how the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx were made by survivors from Atlantis around the year 10,500 BC, and his prophecies about the future. And the one of his prophecies that's received the most attention in recent years relates to the Hall of Records, the chamber allegedly containing the secrets of Atlantis that was supposed to lie, uh, lie beneath the Sphinx at Giza. Casey predicted it would be discovered uh, and opened in 1998, and that this event would mark the beginning of a new age for humankind. I mean, think of the potential. You know, if someone convinced us that they had entered the Hall of Records and knew its secrets. I mean, wow. Um, some of Casey's prophecies actually also had a political context, which is sometimes lost on us today, and it's very important. For example, 1943, he predicted that by 1968, China would become Christian. <clears throat> um, um, well, it would become a democracy, actually. Um, then it would be converted to Christianity. I mean, it does seem crazy, um, and of course it never happened. But it does need to be seen in the context of the time he made the prediction. And also what, what else was going on kind of around him then. During the 1930s and, and 40s, there was a serious political movement in the United States that aimed to Christianize China. It was, a, it was a campaign, it was a sort of crusade. Although this might seem to be somewhat unrealistic, um, it did have some very high level support, including from the Vice President um, Henry Wallace, Roosevelt's Vice President in the 1940s. So Casey's prediction fitted in with that campaign, that very high level campaign. And you wonder, you have to wonder, is that why he made it? to encourage support for it. Is it that way round? And Casey's prediction about the opening of the Hall of Records also fits, actually, with Henry Wallace's ideas. Casey said that this would happen in 1998 and would be the trigger for world-changing events. Most importantly, it would mark the coming of the master of the world, which many believe meant the second coming of Christ, and the emergence of a new root race. And he also said that this, this would bring in an age when, and I quote, true Ameri Americanism would be the dominant power in the world, which 
he defined as American values governed by the principles of Freemasonry. Obviously, that would somewhat appeal to American Freemasons. Now, that's Henry Wallace. Um, and of course, all of that appears to fit very much with the ideas of Henry Wallace, a prominent Freemason. And he's a very interesting character. He was a vice president of Roosevelt. Um, he was deeply interested in the esoteric. He was a, a theosophist, a, a committed Freemason. He was responsible um, for the eye and the triangle symbol being placed on the American dollar bills, which is actually the re reverse side of the Great Seal of the United States, which many people believe to be a Masonic symbol, although it probably wasn't originally. Um, but the point is that, is it, maybe this way around, um, that even, even American Freemasons, including Wallace, came to believe it was a, from a, a Masonic symbol. He had a particular interpretation of the meaning. He said it represented the moment when the missing capstone would be returned to the Great Pyramid, signaling the beginning of a time when America would become the dominant power in the world. And this is a quote from Wallace's book. It will take a more definite recognition of the grand architect of the universe before the apex stone is finally fitted in place and this nation in the full strength of its power is in position to assume leadership among the nations in inaugurating the new order of the ages. And this refers, of course, to linking a missing capstone on the Great Pyramid, but that's what Casey did too. Casey also linked his new, his new age to be triggered by the opening of the Hall of Records and the triumph of Freemasonry and true Americanism with the placing of the golden capstone on the Great Pyramid. Now, of course, Casey's ideas, Wallace's ideas, are so simple, similar that they can't be coincidence, but who got it from whom? So there are actual big questions. Were Casey's prophecies shaped, perhaps subconsciously, by the then current political agenda, such as Wallace's, or was he shaping his prophecies to fit them? The point is, of course, that once a prophecy has been made, those who believe in them can ensure they happen. You probably all do remember that the millennium was to have been marked in Egypt by, guess what, the lowering of a golden capstone onto the top of the Great Pyramid by helicopter, Why an image of the Eye of Horus was projected onto the side of the pyramid with lasers. Um, this would, of course, have fulfilled exactly Casey's prophecies, and it would have been the moment that they talked about Wallace and Casey. We now know, of course, the ceremony didn't happen. The Egyptian government, uh, who had been okay with it, discovered the Masonic connections. Um, and as Freemasonry is banned in Egypt, they canceled the ceremony. So in a sense, in that sense, the prophecy did not happen. America did not triumph. Um, we have to say that that was in part due to the Stargate conspiracy. But this is only part of the story, which Clive will continue to unravel. And now I'm going to be unmiked publicly. Ah, oh, right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, don't worry, I'm not going to say Illuminati. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The point is, from, from that image and what Lynn was talking about with um, Wallace's interpretation of this uh, symbol, and um, you know, what Edgar Casey said, is that these kind of things do have political uh, connotations, political implications. Um, but Lynn and I were interested when Henry Wallace's name came up in connection with Edgar Casey because we knew about him in another context. Um, Henry Wallace, as Lynn said, was um, uh, President Roosevelt's 
uh, vice president during Roosevelt's second term, so it's 1940 to 44. He was actually a member of Roosevelt's cabinet throughout Roosevelt's presidency, and it was during that period that he did the dollar bill thing. Um, but of course, um, I mean, he, Wallace narrowly lost the vice presidential nomination to Harry Truman when Roosevelt went for a third term. And of course, if he hadn't lost that uh, nomination and been vice president, he would have actually become president when Roosevelt died in office in 1945. But as I say, we knew about him in a, another context. Because in the late 1940s and early 50s, uh, Henry Wallace funded an interesting setup in the state of Maine called the Round Table Foundation. And this is a picture of where it was based in Maine. Um, I should actually say partly funded, but I'll come back to that. Now, the, the Round Table Foundation was set up to conduct research into parapsychology. And it was the idea of this guy, uh, who's a, a medical doctor named Andrea Puharic. Um, and as I say, it was set up to do basically laboratory research into extrasensory perception and similar things. Um, and also uh, brought in some of the most famous mediums and psychics of the time. For example, the Irish medium Eileen Garrett and a Dutch clairvoyant who was very well known at the time called Peter Herkos. So they were brought into the laboratory to be studied. But although the, the lab was kind of set up on scientific principles, it was, as Puharic acknowledged, very much based on and oriented towards the teachings of Alice Bailey, who Lynn talked about earlier, a you know, very influential New Age teacher. The Round Table Foundation was actually astonishingly well connected at the very top levels of American society, because not only did it have the patronage of a former vice president, it included members of some of the leading families, the richest families in the States. For example, this is a lady called Alice Bouverie, who was actually a member of the, the Astor family, you know, a very, you know, one of the great blue blood families of America. She was very involved in the Round Table Foundation's work. Another very key figure, um, who helped uh, Puharic set the place up and became kind of his second in command there was um, this guy, inventor and philosopher Arthur Young, who I'm sure many of you know about. Um, Arthur Young was essentially the inv inv inventor of the Bell helicopter, and that invention had made him a fortune. And he used that fortune to pursue his own interest in spiritual philosophies and spiritual matters. And Arthur Young was actually married into the Forbes family, so again, one of the leading uh, wealthiest families in the States. Uh, he was married to Ruth Forbes, who was also very involved in the Foundation's work. Now, there, there are two ways of telling the next part of the story. But first of all, I'll tell it the way it's supposed to be told, if you like, the official version, the way the people involved wanted it to be told. And what happened was that in uh, the, the end of 1952, the Roundtable Round, the Round Foundation was working with uh, another, uh, well, a psychic and mystic, an Indian named Dr. Vinod. And they brought him into the laboratory and were studying him. And, but one day he began to channel. And he began to channel two entities who said that they were actual representatives of what they called the nine, or the nine principles, and sometimes the nine principles of God. A couple of significant points in the way these entities presented themselves through Vinod. Uh, I'm not making any kind of judgment on whether these entities were real or uh, you know, coming out of Vinod's subconscious. Uh, I'll talk about them as if they're um, what they claim to be. Um, first of all, these two entities called themselves simply by initials. They called themselves R and M. Now, Alice Bailey, in her earlier teachings, had, um, you know, from this entity that she called the Tibetan, had taught that when the New Age was about to happen, it would be heralded in by the appearance of two 
masters. And they were going to be called the Masters R and the Master M. So clearly there was a connection between Alice Bailey's teaching and what Vinod was channeling. And it would have been very obvious to Piharich and Arthur Young, who were very much into Alice Bailey. So that's one point. The second point is that the term nine principles has a particular significance in terms of the theories of Schwaller de Lubitsch. As I'm, I'm sure everyone here will know, the ancient Egyptian religion of Heliopolis, the one which inspired the building of the Giza pyramids, uh, centered on a group of nine gods, which are known as the great Ennead group of nine, uh, who are headed by the creator god Atum. Um, and the other eight gods, which includes familiar deities such as Isis and Osiris, are essentially seen as manifestations of Atom. Now, the ancient Egyptian word that is usually translated as God is Neta, but Shwala de Lubitsch translated it instead. He translated Neta as principle. And as far as we've been able to establish, he was the first person, and really in some ways the only person, to have done that. So these entities describing themselves as emissaries of the nine principles or the nine principles of God seems to be a specific reference not only to the great Ennead of Heliopolis, but also to be specifically drawn from Schwaller de Lubitsch's work. Um, his, his work in which he had that translation, incidentally, had, had been recently published uh, just well, a couple of years earlier, although at that point they were only available in French. Um, and then what happened is for the next six months until uh, Dr. Vinod returned to India, uh, I think regularly, I think once a week, um, a group was gathered, a group of nine people, um, to hear the nine's kind of wisdom being channeled through Vinod. Uh, this group obviously uh, included Puharich and Arthur and Ruth Young and Alice Bouverie. Uh, possibly Henry Wallace, though we don't know for sure. Henry Wallace certainly visited the foundation, but the thing is, the identities of most of this group of nine that met to listen to the channeling has always been kept secret. Uh, similarly, what was actually said, uh, very little of what was actually said during those sessions has ever been published. So, as I say, that went on for six months, just another kind of sitter group around a channeler, really. Um, and then after that, the Round Table Foundation carried on its business until 1958, when its members, uh, Puharich, split the, uh, disbanded the organisation and its members went their own separate ways. Throughout the 1960s, Puharich really had a double career. He was an inventor of medical devices, but he also established an international repu represent, sorry, reputation as a parapsychologist. Uh, most famously studying a Brazilian psychic surgeon, Arrigo. But that was to pale into insignificance in 1971 because Puharich became the person who discovered Uri Geller. Um, that's Puharich. You see, the 60s had happened to Puharich. He changed a bit. Um, what happened was Puharich went to Tel Aviv in 1971 to evaluate Geller and then he brought him back to the USA for testing uh, at the California Research Institute called SRI International. But pretty much as soon as Puharich met Uri in Israel, he hypnotized him, and he hypnotized him in order to try and find out where Geller's abilities came from. And what happened was that when um, he put Geller into a hypnotic trance, Geller started to channel. He started to channel something he was called Spectra, which claimed to be a conscious computer aboard a spaceship somewhere out in the cosmos. But Puharich, for some reason that's not really apparent, suggested that there might be a connection to the nine principles he'd been in touch with 20 years before. And Spectra immediately agreed there was, and said it was actually the nine who had programmed Uri Geller with his powers when Geller was a small child. 
And through Geller, the nine alerted Puharic to what they said was his life's mission, which was to use Geller's talents to alert the world to an imminent mass landing of spaceships that would bring representatives of the nine. But that didn't really work out because after Geller was taken to the States and began appearing on the media and quickly became an international psychic superstar, in 1973 he bowed out of this, um, turned his back on it completely, and Puharic had to find other channels, which he did. He found a, a series of other um, psychics, none of whom lasted very long, before finally he settled on an American psychic and healer named Phyllis Schlemmer, and this is she. Um, Phyllis Schlemmer had been a medium since she was a child, a kind of traditional spiritualist medium, and she had a spirit guide whose name was Tom, and she assumed this was the spirit of her deceased grandfather. But after she met Puharic and Puharic hypnotised her, Tom suddenly announced that he'd been an extraterrestrial all the time. And he was, of course, an emissary of the Nine. So we can see a pattern here. Um, Puharic would come across people who already claimed to be in contact with some kind of Discana entity, hypnotise them, and suggest that their entity was really a, a messenger for the Nine. And that suggestion would invariably be taken up. There were several other examples of him doing this with psychics. So it does raise the question of whether Piharic was actually stage managing the whole thing. Um, Schlemmer wasn't the Nine's only channel. There was a, a whole network of psychics in touch with them, but she was kind of the main one, the official one, what, what the Nine called their transceiver. And we basically had, at that point, what was a, a rerun of what had happened at the Round Table Foundation 20 years before. Puharic set up an establishment in Ossining, New York, uh, that was called Lab 9, and gathered a group of people, disciples if you like, who would gather regularly to hear what Tom had to say through their transceiver. Um, at this time, the, the, the Nine actually started calling themselves the Council of Nine, which is the name by which they became best known in kind of New Age circles. And again, this um, group that was gathered around to listen to the channeling was a pretty impressive bunch. It included multimillionaire businessmen, uh, including members of Canada's, Canada's richest family, the Bronfmans. Uh, it had members of European nobility. It had leading New Age and alternative writers, people like Lyle Watson. It had scientists from SRI International. At least one prominent political figure who was a personal friend of then President Gerald Ford, but whose name is kept out of the records. Um, but even bigger than that, one of the members of this circle that used to sit and listen to the Nine was uh, Gene Roddenberry, uh, creator, of course, of Star Trek. Another key player in Lab Nine was this guy. Dr. James J. Hurtak, James J. Hurtak, who I'm sure many of you know about, and probably actually some know. Um, he was appointed by the Nine as Puharich's second in command, so a similar role to Arthur Young's in the earlier Round Table Foundation. Now, in fact, Hurtak claims to have been in independent contact with the Nine since 1973, when he says they programmed him with mystical awareness and incredible knowledge of the cosmos. All of which he put into a book, which is there, called The Keys of Enoch, or The Book of Knowledge, which you know, is a very kind of Bible-looking tome. But when you actually read The Keys of Enoch, it's very clear it owes a lot to Alice Bailey. It uses a lot of the concepts and the terminology and the kind of system of the way the universe is organised that came from Alice Bailey's writing. So it's essentially an update of Bailey with a bit more science -y, really. But during the channelling sessions at Lab 9, this entity, Tom, in fact, in answer to a, a question by Gene Roddenberry, finally revealed his true identity and that of the Nine themselves. Tom claimed he was actually 
not Tom, but Atom, the creator god of the religion of Heliopolis, and the nine were none other than the great Ennead of that religion. However, as we've seen, there were clues about this from the start, such as the use of Swallow de Lubitsch's term nine principles, and certainly signs Puharich had known about this all along, right from the beginning. So what was the nine's message as it emerged from their various channels? Well, it's their advanced extraterrestrial beings or intelligences from Sirius, of course, who created the human species and had a profound influence on the origins of human civilization, in particular that of Egypt. They claimed a special association with Giza. According to Tom, there were secret chambers under the Giza pyramids that can be accessed from beneath the Sphinx. Obviously not the first to come out with that idea. They also say that the Nine have watched over humanity ever since, in particular guiding our religions. They claim to be behind all the world's religions except one, which I'll come to. And they say that this is a particularly critical moment in Earth's history and they're about to return to um, put right what's gone wrong. And all of this is set against uh, an apocalyptic background of a cosmic war between the forces of light and darkness. However, even with such impressive contacts, both terrestrial and extraterrestrial, things didn't go that well for Lab 9. Um, it broke up in 1978 after a series of unfortunate events that culminated in an arson attack on the Ossining estate. Piharic fled to Mexico, saying that his life was in danger from the CIA. He came back to the States two years later, saying he'd done some kind of deal with the CIA. And he doesn't seem to have played any further part in the Nine story from then until his death about 15 years later. But, you know, so far it all seems very exciting, doesn't it? The gods of ancient Egypt, or the beings once worshipped as gods, our creators, our protectors, re-establishing contact, bringing revelations about our origins and our destiny. And initially, when Lynn and I were, began piecing this story together, that's what they thought. Maybe some, sorry, that's what we thought. Um, maybe something's really going on here. But the story I've just told you is the story as it was presented to the public through Puharich's books and works such as The Only Planet of Choice. The story of the Nine, the story as the Nine, or their human representatives, wanted it to be told. And as usual, Lynn and I looked behind the story, especially at the parts that we weren't being told. And what we found puts quite a different light on these events. Um, the central figure in this drama was, of course, um, Pugh Harich. Here he is, back in the 1950s again. Throughout his career, he had very close links with the US military and intelligence community. He was actually got his medical training in the US Army, but was given a medical discharge in 1947, after which he established the Round Table Foundation. But the evidence is, I mean, very strong evidence, is that this medical discharge was, re discharge was really just a cover to allow him to set up what was an apparently civilian research institution where he could study individuals, you know, mediums and psychics, who wouldn't have been comfortable being taken into a military facility to be put in one of their laboratories. Um, research ours and that of other people has established that in addition to private sponsorship by the likes of Henry Wallace, the Round Table Foundation was funded by the US Army. Uh, also, the building and lands that it was uh, in were actually given to Puharich by the US Navy. Even in his own account of events at the foundation, Puharich refers to visits by high-ranking army officers, specifically from the army's psychological warfare section. More than that, right in the middle of those first contacts with the Nine, Puharich was redrafted into the army. What happened was, uh, in late 52, about a month before the first contact with the Nine, Puharich delivered a paper to the Pentagon. The paper was entitled, 
an evaluation of the possible usefulness of extrasensory perception in psychological warfare. And the very next day after going to the Pentagon and delivering that paper, an order was signed redrafting him into the army with the rank of captain. Um, the fact he was redrafted is, is, gives the game away that his medical discharge some years earlier was um, just a cover story. So for the next three years, Piharich served at the US Army's Chemical Weapons Center in Maryland, which is that, uh, continuing his work at the Round Table Foundation during his leave. And while he was away, it was Arthur Young who took over running the foundation and therefore running the nine channeling sessions. The Chemical Weapons Center, where Piharich was stationed, wasn't only, as its name might suggest, concerned with chemical and biological warfare, but it was also the Army's main facility for psychological warfare. And that's what Puharich was working on. In particular, he was experimenting with, among other things, the effects of LSD, uh, other hallucinogenic substances, particularly those used by Mexican shaman, which was part of a joint project with, between the Army and the CIA. Um, and that project was in turn part of the CIA's notorious uh, MKUltra program, its, its so-called mind control program. Now, all that puts a rather different complexion on the nine contacts that Puharich was running at exactly the same time. Puharich's connections with the intelligence community continued after the 1950s. He was involved in the ESP research which included remote viewing at SRI International, which uh, it was later revealed was initiated and funded by the CIA. And it was the CIA who sent Puharich to Israel to evaluate Yuri Geller and bring him back to SRI for testing. SRI crop up again and again in this story, sometimes in very unexpected places. Um, this SRI, Stanford Research Institute, it's a scientific research organization that from its establishment in the late 1960s, when it was basically spun out of Stanford University, uh, has always been a major contractor to the US government and in particular to the US defense and intelligence uh, agencies. So earlier I mentioned Puharich's apparent stage managing of the nine contacts through hypnosis. So was the whole nine thing, the whole council of nine things, some kind of um, experiment by Puharich on behalf of the military and intelligence community? And if so, why? To what end? The story didn't end with Puharich. Phyllis Schlemmer continued channeling the nine and, and continued until her death just four years ago. In 1992, a book of their channeling based on sessions from the 1950s onwards called The Only Planet of Choice, came out and became a New Age bestseller. And as you can see, it has a front cover endorsement by James Hurtak. Uh, Hurtak himself went on to bigger and better things, traveling the world, giving workshops on his own book of inspired revelations, The Keys of Enoch, as he's still doing. And the nine, or rather those who claimed to represent them, continue to have a hotline to the top levels of American society and political establishment. Individuals connected with the circle around the nine even had some influence over Al Gore when he was vice president. And Al Gore, of course, nearly became president, a bit like Henry Wallace before. Uh, so maybe we should be grateful that George W. won the election in 2000. Only joking. Um, so, so if the nine contacts were the result of some kind of manipulation, clearly that manipulation continued after Puharich left the scene. Um, so maybe you know, all that involvement of his with psychological warfare and agencies such as the CIA, was, was it just a coincidence? Or did the Nine choose to make contact with him because he had those connections? Well, it comes down to the question of whether the Nine really were what they claimed to be, the gods of ancient Egypt. And sadly, perhaps, it seems they're not. Um, the Nine's knowledge of ancient Egypt seems to derive more from the works of Alice Bailey, Edgar Cayce, and Shwala de Lubitsch than it does from archaeology or Egyptology. That doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, of course, but the Nine have made some very basic errors in their account of history. I don't have time to go into, but they're in the book, which really call their 
uh, claims into question. Um, it, a lot of what the Nine said, particularly some of its kind of racial ideas and its religious ideas, um, are kind of quite worrying. For example, there's a distinct uh, anti-Islamic theme in the Nine material. Tom declared that the religion of Islam is under the influence of what he called the Fallen One, which was the, is the leader of the cosmic forces of darkness. Hertak's Keys of Enoch also labels Muslims children of darkness and speaks of the Kaaba stone in Mecca as being the embodiment of the universe's forces of negativity. All very worrying, particularly in today's world. And all the more worrying, as from the late 70s, there was a real concerted, orchestrated effort which gathered momentum as the millennium approached to sell the Nine and their message, both to powerful individuals and to a wider audience, using apparently independent discoveries, um, archaeological, historical and scientific, that appeared to back um, the, the Nine's claims up. It's actually surprising how much in the alternative history field can be traced back to people who were part of that group around the Nine. Um, earlier I talked about Arthur Young, Bihar, which is second in command of the Round Table Foundation, who after that foundation was closed down, set up his own, the Foundation for the Study of Consciousness in Philadelphia. In the mid-1960s, Young became a mentor to a young student named Robert Temple. Um, who actually became, at the age of 21, the secretary of Young's foundation. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room will know who Robert Temple is, um, the author of the classic 1976 book, The Serious Mystery. In some ways, the book that really started it all. Um, it was actually Arthur Young who inspired Robert Temple to write that book. Um, it was his. Uh, it was Young who, in the mid 1960s, first brought Temple's attention to the, the central mystery, the mystery of the Dogon of Mali, and their apparently uh, ad advanced information about the star Sirius, and who encouraged him to write it. Um, so we have Arthur Young to thank for the Sirius mystery, which is a book that seemed to provide independent academic support for Alice Bailey's channeled teachings uh, about the influence of beings from Sirius uh, on the human past, on the ancient past. But Arthur Young was a follower of Alice Bailey's, so maybe it's not such a coincidence after all. Um, James Hertak became a major player in events in the search for hidden chambers at Giza, particularly beneath the Sphinx from the mid-70s through to the 90s. Um, in the 70s, working with a team from SRI International. Hertak's ideas came to influence writers such as Graham Hancock and Robert Boval. You'll find him referenced and quoted in them as an authority without any mention that he claims to have a hotline to the gods of Egypt. This is... Um, uh, her attack and Robert both at an event in California last year. Um, now, I've heard the bell, so I know that I'm running short of time, so I do have to skip the next bit, I'm afraid. Um, it was also about how something else that was brought into this sort of unfolding drama in the 80s and 90s, the famous face on Mars, all that can be traced back to people that were part of the Nine Circle. Um, Hertak was a major player in publicising that, so I'm having to skip the detail here to keep to time. Um, so, basically we find all these different disparate strands of um, belief about the ancient past and particularly its connection with places, extraterrestrial connections with places like Sirius and Mars all seem to be drawn together more and more tightly as the millennium approached. And what seemed to us was that any discoveries that were being made were being spun, often quite shamelessly, to make them fit or appear to fit theories and pronouncements of people like Charlotte Lubitsch and Edgar Cayce. Um, 
And we could, it, it, or it seemed to us that a trail was being lay, led that would ultimately lead people from those discoveries um, to the nine and therefore to those who claimed to be in touch with them and speak for them. That's what made Lynn and I want to write the Stargate Conspiracy, to bring the full story, including the hidden parts, to the attention of people who were getting excited by, for example, Hancock and Beauval's books. And we think that our book did its job, because by making these connections public, we kind of burst a bubble that was being built up, kind of took the wind out of our sails, because we could see that at some point, this was all heading towards a point where somebody was going to come out with a big reveal and say that this all proved um, uh, you know, what the Nine had been saying all along was true, therefore we should listen to the people that claimed to speak for them. Uh, we don't think for a moment that's the end of it. Um, whoever was behind the Nine thing will be trying to find another way of using all that. And I just want to, to finish by making, really summarising what Lynn and I are really saying and why we say it. Because after Andy asked us to speak today about Stargate Conspiracy, and as we were putting this talk together, we, we sort of joked between ourselves that our theme should really be, don't believe what you hear at conferences like this. <laughs> um, not even what we say. Um, but no, that's not really what we're saying. The reason we got so concerned about the way these things were and are being manipulated is because we know, we believe at least, that there are genuine mysteries about the ancient world and about the origins of civilization. And researchers like Andy and the others here today are right to be asking the questions and right to be trying to answer them. The danger, we think, comes when people pop up who claim they already have the answers because they've got them through their hotline to the gods. We weren't saying, and we're not saying, as some took it at the time, that all the evidence that conventional history is wrong has been invented in order to create this new belief system and to fool everybody. What we're saying is that uh, all that evidence has been hijacked, it's been spun. Um, not just the the evidence, but actually in some ways the, um, the gods of Egypt themselves have been hijacked. So for example, just to give some examples, Robert Schock's work on the water erosion of the Sphinx really does present evidence that the Sphinx is much older than the history books say. But as Lynn said, it doesn't, as claimed by John Anthony West, prove Schwalodolubich right either. Neither does it, as Graham Hancock tried to do in Fingerprints of the Gods, support Edgar Cayce's psychic information about Atlantis. Similarly, Robert Bovell's Orion Giza correlation theory. The basic idea that Giza pyramids were laid out to reflect the stars of Orion's belt hangs together, makes sense. What doesn't work is Robert Bovell's claim that the pyramids specifically represent Orion's belt, Orion's belt as it appeared in 10,500 BC, and therefore supports Case's psychic information, because that is easily proven to be wrong. Neither do Lynn and I reject information that comes from channeling or other psychic means. Far from it. Uh, we've been around long enough to know better. We've known Andy far too long to, know, to, to think that. Um, but information that comes through those means has to be tested just like any other source of information. Psy psychics can and do get things wrong. They are only human. And the sources of that channeled information, whatever they are, can and do mislead and manipulate. We shouldn't accept something just because it comes from an unseen source. What we're saying is that we should all be cautious when a message, spiritual, religious, and above all political, is attached to the wonders and mysteries of the ancient world. Um, so I say, we shouldn't uh, believe something just because it comes through a psychic, just because it comes from an invisible source. Or for that matter, we shouldn't believe it even if it comes from what claims to be a god or the gods. Um, as I say, we found discoveries that are genuine in themselves and genuinely intriguing and genu genuinely meaningful 
were being hijacked and turned to serve another agenda. So were the works of people like Edgar Cayce, or the psychic information of Edgar Cayce. They all, were all being forced to, or to fit this agenda that supported the nine. And the Egyptian gods themselves, as I said, have been hijacked as part of that process. Um, and that was another thing that really motivated Len and I to write this book and to do this research. Because we were really, one of the things that drove us is the way that the great Ennead and the religion of Heliopolis, um, which Lynn and I so respect, and you know, in particular the wisdom of Heliopolis found in texts such as the pyramid text, was being hijacked and used and abused. So I want to actually end with this image, which is an image of the real nine. Thank you.